Hello again, sword friends. It's Perfect. here to make a reply video to Matt Easton of Scala Gladiatoria and Dave Rawlings of London Longsword Academy. The guys have made awesome videos. Please go and check them out. I'll make a link to them below on, on a great topic that everyone wants to talk about, Katana versus Rapier. So this is something that's of interest to everyone because it's a really interesting point in history when Japan, which has, was historically closed um, it, for centuries and centuries, its borders were, were closed. But for about 100 years, it was open and engaged in trade with Europe. And we had arms that uh, came in and arms and armor were incorporated into Japanese culture. And we had goods that went out uh, away to other parts of Asia and even as far away as, as Europe um, from Japan. And so everyone wants to know what happened when when the Portuguese, the British, the Dutch um, in, encountered these uh, these Japanese warriors. So I've decided to add my own two cents to, to the conversation by providing some historical accounts that are prescient to the discussion at hand. I haven't yet found the gold standard that we're looking for, which is an actual documented account of a duel between a katana and a rapier. I'm looking for that, but so far in English I haven't found that. Maybe it still exists somewhere in Portuguese, so anyone who's listening to this speaks Portuguese, please do do some research. The closest I've found so far comes from uh, um, a 1950s uh, uh, account from Boxer in Fidalgo's of the East, and it reads as follows. Um, uh, let's see what it says here. Um, in either case, he met with a sticky end, for he, together with 14 other Portuguese, was killed in a brawl with the Japanese at Hirado in the year 1561. That season, there were no less than five Portuguese ships in Japan, one of which was commanded by a certain Alfonso Faz um, and went to Satsuma, where he was also killed in the port of Akune by some samurai. Specifically, it says samurai. Accidentally, according to Shimada Zu, the local daimyo, these are the first recorded armed clashes between Japanese and Europeans. So that's an account from the, you know, middle of the 16th century, and it explicitly talks about the samurai getting into it. And obviously it did happen, as they're in their trading and trying to navigate differences in social norms and drinking in, in bars and, and trying to not run afoul of local warlords. Um, obviously it happened. And so we'll, we'll see if uh, anyone can, can find an actual written source either on the Japanese side or on the European side of what we're all interested in. But we're here to talk about swords, of course. So uh, I have gotten ahead and taken a look at some of the encounters uh, to deal with who's going to win um, the, who's going to come out on, on top. So there was a little bit of a discussion as to if a katana could defeat a rapier. So quick definitions out of the way. Both of those terms are easy to um, mistake what swords we're actually ta talking about. So if we're first talking about the Japanese side of things, um, when people are interested in looking at a katana, it's very easy to engage in synecdoche and call everything a katana. Um, for one, if we're strictly looking at, yes, katana, the character does refer to almost any type of, of blade, but everyone really means uchi katana. The longer of the two swords were worn by samurai, especially during the Edo, the shorter one being a shoto or wakizashi. But there is a large spectrum of different types of blade design. There are blades that are narrower in, um, or thinner, I should say, in cross section that are better for a civilian context where you're dealing with less resistance and very good at cutting. These are the type of blade profiles you see in a tatami cutting, for example. But there are also blades that are used in times of war of all types, even the, the, the longer tachi, the shorter wakizashi, the kodachi, that have what is called a lot of miku or meat on the sides of them. They're still very, very sharp, but they are more durable and more resistant to being um, damaged by the things that you encounter on a battlefield. They might be a little bit more difficult to strike lighter targets like tatami cutting with, so which is why you wouldn't see them in uh, the the uh, the type of tatami cutting competitions. So 
that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, what type of sword you're, you're discussing. If you're talking about the, the 17th century, the 16th or 17th century, you're more likely to find a more civilian style katana than the earlier, longer tachi that were more robustly built. That's one thing. On the European side of thing, the name rapier is a wastebasket taxon. Almost any sword is called a, a rapier regardless of what type of blade and a myriad of, of different types of, of hilt configurations. So there's long blades, there's short blades, there's wide blades, there's thin blades, there's blades that can cut, there's blades that can't cut at all. Uh, um, Matt Easton just showed a, a lovely sword from L.K. Chen, the Saxon, um, which has a, a blade wide enough to be an arming sword that's put on uh, a rapier style hilt. So again, we have to think about what type of sword we're discussing when we're talking about a rapier. And it's made even more confusing because if you're trying to do this research that I'm doing and looking at the actual period sources, in most of the cases, they're not using the term rapier at all. They're just calling it a sword, <laughs> which is what almost any of these uh, weapons would have been called in period. So in for the purposes of what we're discussing, we're talking about thrust-centric, very long-bladed swords that have complex hilts. Um, there's going to be a spectrum still, so side swords and rapiers are very closely related and will have a large degree of overlap, and they'll eventually turn into small swords, and you have things like the Spanish Taza that have a cup hilt and have no edge on them that fall in there somewhere. But uh, for the most part, we're talking about things that develop maybe around 1570 or so. They probably take take on their, their proper shape and will continue for, for the next 150, 200 years, depending on what part of Europe we're, we're looking at. So to that end, I have a couple of accounts for us from um, both the European side and then from the Japanese side. Now, to answer the question of which one will win in this contest of steel wills, I've decided to look at their points of failure. So I have come up with just a handful of things that we can look at that will talk about blades breaking. Now, again, that won't tell tell us all of the story, but it's kind of interesting to see when it, it documents under what circumstance a blade will break, that kind of gives you an idea of the expectations of what the sword could do and couldn't do. So, Here's a couple of accounts. The first comes from Italy. So, from 15th century, we, uh, I'm sorry, from 1570, we have um, Giacomo di Grassi, um, and he discusses. Uh, this is part of his, one of his treatises, which he discusses several different weapons. Specifically, he's talking about rapier and buckler here, and so he's talking about how the buckler can be constructed and used. So. De Grassi says, as concerning his greatness, standing still on the form of the buckler, by how much the greater it is, by so much the better it voids the blows. But it is to be regarded that in hinder not the eye, sight, or at least as little as it is possible. Besides this, there is required that about the middle thereof there be a little strong circle of iron, well nailed, and hollowed from the buckler, so that between the circle and the buckler the sword may enter, by means whereof a man may take hold fast of the sword, or break a piece of the point. But this is done rather by chance than by any rule may be given how a man should take hold and break it, for the sword comes not with such slowness, and is such quantity of time as requisite in that behalf. So, he's saying, you have your buckler, you have a little hole and you have a piece of iron on it and the sword is supposed to be able to come through and you're supposed to be able to either grab it or snap it by presumably lodging in the buckler. So that's interesting, but he says you can't plan on it happening. The sword's not just going to come in slowly. It's just going to happen by chance. You just have to find the opportunity to take it. But still, tr just having a sword be having the tip grabbed and snapped or having it lodged in a, in a buckler and snapped. I have I have this Civil War era spadroon and it comes down to to maybe one and a half millimeters, two millimeters here at the tip. 
it's it's got a, a, a cutting profile in in profile and width but it's still very thin and it flexes without me being worried about its its snapping there so we're talking about a blade that is more fragile significantly than this very thin spadroon as far as considering how delicate it is in the foible of the blade. So that is one account from 1570 from Italy. Then we have from England, Joseph Swetnam from 1617. Ah, oh, what does he warn us? Ah. He says, Also take heedeth that thou strike not with thy rapier, for so thou may break it and bring thyself to thine enemy's mercy, and it may be he will take the advantage of thee. So he specifically says, do not strike with your rapier, for it may break. That's a little bit different than what um, Dave Rawlings was saying, because Dave Rawlings was saying it, you may break your rapier if you try and oppose the longsword. In this case, he's talking about about the rapier snapping as a result of of striking. And I don't have it here, but he says if you have to strike, only do wrist cuts, cuts with, with the rapier. And that's really, really interesting. So we... Obviously, another an opponent, uh, an opposing swordsman can strike with a great deal of force, and you're going to be able to mitigate how much of that force you have to um, absorb, depending on what manner of block you engage in. However, when you're talking about the amount of force that an, a sword blade has to undertake, the most force, the most stress on the blade, almost certainly is going to be when you're striking another target. Um, certainly, you can put a tremendous amount of force on the blade, especially a long blade like a rapier, if you just wind up with your entire body and lay into it. So this is something that I don't think that anyone has discussed up until this point. To be honest, I think that the largest chance that a rapier has of being cut by a katana would be if the rapierist was trying to swing as hard as possible and the samurai did a hard static block. That may actually be the situation under which the, the rapier is most likely to break. To be fair, Swetnam um, also was even-handed and discussed how swords, so not rapiers, but more standard uh, type of swords, either basket-hilted swords or arming swords or cut-and-thrust swords, um, were equally likely to fail. So he goes on to say, But I say, and by good experience I speak, if that he which striketh in fight giveth his enemy a great advantage. Besides, a sword may either bow or break, and so by that means he that striketh may fall into his enemy's mercy. So he was advising in using the thrust and trying to avoid giving heavy heavy blows in, in this case. Um, and he's saying that the, the swords that he had access to at the time, he obviously didn't have a lot of faith faith in the quality of the, uh, the metal or the, the uh, production of the swords that he had because he felt that they might bow or bend or just break. So it's not just rapiers that he felt had this problem. It was swords of... I guess, almost any kind that uh, Swetnam was concerned with in 1617. So that's true on the European side. What's going on on the Japanese side? So we turn to the change in um, in in the development of, of Japanese blades. As mentioned, I mentioned before that there are different types of Japanese blade, and there are also different schools. There are different periods of Japanese production. And there's certainly a different quality of, uh, of, of Japanese swords. During the uh, Ming Dynasty, there were thousands of swords being uh, exported from Japan to Ming China. And at the beginning, they were being paid top dollar for them. And as the uh, centuries went along from the 14th into the 15th century, um, the quality began to decline so that Japan was having to 
increase the number of swords going over in order to get the same amount of money from China to the point that it was becoming ridiculous. They were obviously producing or, you know, sending over less and less quality grade uh, swords as, as time went along. Um, so there's a large spectrum of, of quality from the different schools, different smiths, just different periods of time depending on what we're looking at. Um, I want to look at accounts by a smith. This this section is going to test my ability to pronounce Japanese names. I've read them thousands of times, but forgive me, I'm not always great at pronouncing them. So we're going to start by looking at accounts being recorded by a, this smith from the 1700s, um, Suishin Shi Masahide. He took special notice of what was going on in this Edo period, this time of peacefulness, and how the swords were becoming more and more elaborate and decorated, how the hamon, in particular, the hardened portion of the blade in our deferentially hardened Japanese swords, was getting wider and wider and more and more ornate, and this was leading to structural problems with the swords. So this is a record of his. We'll, we'll go through it here. It says, Masahide gained this knowledge empirically through repeated eyewitness accounts and reliable sources concerning swords in actual use. The following incidents um, that Masahide mentioned in which blades with a uh, Hade style hamon were broken. So these are large styles hamon. It is uh, the following are the translation. So we're going to go through 25 accounts. If you can't sit through it all, you can skip ahead to the summary at the end. But I think that they're interesting, so we're going to go through each of these accounts to hear what was actually happening with swords in Japan during this period where we're transferring, uh, we're transitioning from the Shinto area of sword production into the Shin Shinto area of sword production. So, first one. Masahide was at the house of an Akimoto retainer. There was a thief that night. The retainer used the mune of the blade. So that's the back, the spine of the blade. Um, to strike the thief, the blade broke in the middle and the kisaki was knocked off. As a result, it landed on the rooftop of the neighbor's house. This was a katana by the Mizuta Kuneshige uh, with an omidare bahamon. Okay. So he struck the retainer with the back of, and the tip flew off all the way to the neighbor's house. Interesting. Number two, a younger friend of the Akimoto retainer used the mune of the wakazashi to hit a dog. <gasps> the blade broke in the middle and the dog escaped. Oh, that was a close one. It was a mume wakazashi by Echigo no Kami Kanasada with an omidari bahamon. So, two accounts, and already two times, we see them striking with the mune, the back or the spine of the sword. If you have seen Matthew Jensen, please go and visit my, my buddy Matthew's uh, channel. You will see that he tests swords to failure, and a recipe he has for single-edged swords, he will abuse the uh, edge of a sword, get nicks and chunks and cracks in it and then he'll flip the sword over and strike the back of it onto a hard uh immobile target and just one or two strikes and then it'll propagate a crack all the way through and this makes a lot of sense swords are designed in a particular way if they're single edge they have a very thin often very hard fine keen edge and they have a much thicker oftentimes more flexible softer spine to be able to absorb the impact of the strike and to be able to bend backwards. So this is meant to be stiff and go through the target. This is meant to be soft and flex backwards to absorb the shock of the blow. If you turn the sword around, it's all wrong. This is not meant to hit something hard. This is not meant to flex. This is all hard and brittle and is a recipe for, for uh, ruin. So, Number three, in the Shitatani area, a retainer was fighting a merchant. The retainer's blade broke and his arm was cut. The retainer used a Shinto katana by Omi no Kami Suguriha with a wide hamon. 
a merchant use a bison suka uh, suke sada katana. Mashahide witnessed this himself. Number four, a Shitatani fencer, t uh, fencing teacher named Fujigawa was testing a blade by cutting a kabuto. So we haven't talked about blade testing too much in Japan, but um, after a blade is produced, sometimes maybe it wasn't tested at all, but um, a lot of times blades would get certified and you can see it sometimes written on the, the Nakago, on the tang that the blade was tested. Um, blades were tested using a variety of means. Sometimes they were, were tested on, on um, condemned people, on, on criminals. Uh, they, so they were done by cutting through various body parts. Uh, occasionally you would have them tested through uh, mats or, or rice, um, rice straw. Uh, but the, um, the, the most prestigious type of testing to survive was against bits of armor. And one of these is kabutawari, so uh, helmet cutting. So you'd have a helmet and you'd put it on a stand, oftentimes on a pile of rice, and then you'd go whack and you were supposed to be able to make a mark on the helmet and the blade was supposed to be able to survive intact. So a, a, an iron helmet. Um, that was considered a, a real um, test of the smith's skill to be able to make a sword that strong. So that is apparently what's going on here. Let's, let's see how this guy's uh, sword does. Um, so the fencing teacher was testing a blade by cutting a kabuto. The katana broke about 24 centimeters from the kisaki. So 24 centimeters is about one shaku, a little less than a foot. So it broke about there. Uh, actually, the kisaki is back there, so about there. Um, it was a satsuma blade. Number five, in the Shiba area, a martial artist named Akamatsu tested a katana on a kabuto and the sword broke. This was a blade made by Ishido Kurakazu. In an, uh, Inaba, a retainer was arguing with a Shinto priest. A katana was involved and broken. It was an, an Inaba Shinto sword. Number seven, a Satsuma area smith, oh, I'm sorry, number seven, Satsuma area smith tested their katana on thin metal plates. Ha! Huh. Now that is very interesting. So, I think that a majority of modern sword collectors have an idea of what's considered abusive and not abusive and what targets are okay and what targets are not okay. And most people would flunk metal. Um, I occasionally see people going after, you know, water bottles. Okay, that's fine. And even some types of plastic, you, you kind of worry because plastic, not all plastics made the same and some plastic targets are quite thick and can kind of mess up your, your blade. Occasionally I see people going after aluminum cans, soda cans, beer cans, what have you. And I think to myself, okay, aluminum's significantly softer than steel. You'll probably cut through it fine, but I kind of get the heebie-jeebies because it's going to scuff up the sides of the blade and you'll probably have to spend some time uh, cleaning it up afterwards, depending on the type of sword that, that's involved. I have seen um, certain folks doing uh, sword feats before. Um, obviously, there are things like, uh, historically, there were lead cutters um, in the, the 19th century. That, that was a, a, a fun sword test done with big heavy swords. And I've also seen on Japanese television um, guys who uh, have performed uh, cutting of very thin pieces of metal, either pipes or sheets of metal, using katana. And of course, we know from anime the katana can cut through huge pieces of metal. This is the first time I think I've heard of anything, you know, before the industrial age of swords being tested on metal. I could be wrong, but I don't know that Eisenhower as a sword concept goes back that far. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If uh, you know of other accounts of swords being tested against cutting pieces of metal, that go back into the um, 17th century or 18th century, please let me know. Um, let's see what happened. Um, the, the Smiths tested their katana on thin plates of metal and the blades were broken. Oh, didn't work this time. Number 18, Kobayashi Masaoki, a student of um, Masahide, 
made a katana with a big hamon pattern for a retainer of Echigo. The blade broke when hitting stone statues in the garden on the Mune side. It shattered like an icicle. So once again, striking with the back of the blade, and it's very colorful how they say it shattered like an icicle. So again, if we talk about an area being of very hard, and sometimes these edges will be significantly above five, uh, 50 uh, Rockwell hardness, so up to 60, 60 plus uh, Rockwell, depending on uh, the individual blade, you might have a soft back, but if we, if you have hardness, if you have it that brittle, once it breaks catastrophically, you may end up with multiple pieces flying out rather than a, just a clean snap. So for it to describe as shattering like an icicle, uh, that must have been quite the uh, failure to have to have seen. Number nine, an Awa retainer was testing blades by the order of the Lord of the Hachisuga family. He tested blades made by, uh-oh, Shin, Shinkai, Echigo Kanasada, Osafune, Suki, uh, Sukesada, and Masahide. During the Mune testing, so testing on the back, the blades that had big hamon patterns were all broken. The ones with small hamon patterns developed ha-giri. So ha is the, the edge, and giri are little nicks or little cuts. And then it says parenthetically, on the battlefield, this is highly preferable to breaking in half. However, some of these were, these were broken too. So none of the wide hamon pattern blades survived. And of the small hamon pattern blades, it sounds like most of them survived. A couple of them broke, but hagiri developed. So they're striking them again in the worst possible way. And it sounds like micro fractures are starting to develop. But they specifically mentioned this is what they want to see. Because in a battlefield situation, if you accidentally overstress your sword, what you want is for it to be able to absorb it and say, ah, and your sword can be damaged. And that's fine. But at least you still have a sword. You don't want the sword to just catastrophically fail. And then you don't have a sword. So that's what they wanted to see. And the ones with the small uh, Hamon are the ones that survived. Number 10, a family in Shinano had collected more than 150 pieces of broken katana, yari, and naginata from battlefields in the Koto period. So talking about collecting old period blades. That's all that it says, though. Number 11, an Okuyama retainer named Watanabe was doing a cutting test on the lower part of a corpse. So just as we mentioned before, probably cutting um, the bodies of criminals, the katana broke at the monouchi area. It was a seki blade. So the monouchi is the upper part, the striking part of the, essentially the foible of the blade just before the uh, kisaki. Number 12, a bandit attacked the leader of Okiyama retainers. The leader used the muni side of a katana to fight the bandit, but it broke. Then he picked up a bamboo stick and continued to fight. Eventually, he was able to defeat the attacker and use a rope to tie him up. When the retainer checked the bandit, he found wounds caused by the bamboo stick, but none by the katana. He couldn't help but laugh at the situation. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's pretty entertaining. So, again, I'm. it's very interesting seeing everyone's... This is this is an interesting concept. So everyone's still using the back of of the blade, and you know we have in North America the concept of counting coup, where you run up and and tag someone um, in the middle of of battle. Um, but we're seeing again and again people unwilling to use the sharp edge of the sword in what are very bellicose circumstances. A surprising uh, number of times, perhaps, again, there are legal ramifications where they don't want to be on the hook for actually bringing lethal force uh, against the, the opponent or accidentally killing them. But it's surprising to see exactly how frequently the backs of these swords were being used. And unfortunately, it looks like they didn't uh, ha um, hold up very well. Also interesting, don't um, don't don't uh, undersell the usefulness of a, a staff weapon. So all you quarter stick 
um, practitioners, all you Joe and Bo practitioners, hey, a good strong stick is uh, apparently more effective even than the blunt side of a saber. Keep that in mind. Number 13. An Okayama retainer got into an argument with a person on a ferry. He drew his katana and made a cut. The blade caught the wooden pole of the boat and broke at the mono uchi. Ouch. Poor, poor katana. Number 14. A bushi from Mito was doing a cutting test on a skull. Presumably this is not a skull inside of a person if they're just saying a skull, which means it is probably dried out and a lot harder than in the vital state. The bone will ossify and not be as uh, soft as in uh, living uh, tissue. The katana broke. A mito, uh, also, a mito swordsman was fighting with a bushi. His katana broke about 27 centimeters from the kisaki. It was a uh, Heizen Mono with Hiro, wide Suguha. Masahide documented the above examples. Okay, so it doesn't, there are just two examples for one, for number 14. Okay, then it says, Takahiro, an Oshu retainer and a student of Masahide, recorded the following examples. He worked with Masahide on developing the theory of Nihonto functionality and publishing Masahide's research. Okay, so we have some bonus, uh, bonus 10 examples from Masahide's student. Number 15. Five newly made yari by Edo Smith were broken during a wild hog hunt. Huh, that's interesting. I don't research yari very much. I'm a sword guy. But, um, you know, we have the concept of the wild hunts in Europe, and we have big boar spears and things like that. I don't know much about weapons being broken in European hunts, but this is uh, the only time I've heard of Yari and no less five Yari, multiple Yari being broken during a wild hunt in Japan. Very interesting encounter. Number 16. During a fight in Gunma, one combatant used a Mizuta Kunishige katana and his opponent used a well-made Naganata by Satsuma Masai, Masai Kaio. As a result, both were broken. Huh, now that's also fascinating. So you have a katana being drawn against a big polearm. I normally give the advantage to the polearm in, in that sort of a situation. And it doesn't say exactly what went wrong or how badly each of them fared. It just says both were broken. So we don't know the result. But you know, I think that there is sometimes an over... Um, rep, an over uh, representation of pole weapons and um, archery and the like, and an underrepresentation of sword use um, in sort of a battlefield context. It doesn't specifically say this is a battlefield, it just says a fight. But this is a situation where someone had access to a pole arm and someone else drew a katana and Obviously, they went up against each other. So in interesting to see. Number 17. In the Fujioka area, a Mito family ken was being tested with a katana. A ken, or a sorugi, is a straight double-edged Japanese sword. So much like the... Um, here. This is my makeshift ken. So this is a, a, a Chinese gen from uh, sword maker L.K. Chen. Uh, but um, in in the Heian and earlier uh, period, Japan would use double-edged straight swords. And starting around maybe the 8th century or so, they were retired from uh, martial use. So these were no longer used as battlefield weapons, but they continued to be produced mostly as um, religious shrine swords, but they were occasionally kept as swords that were had as, as family heirlooms. So they were continued to be produced by actual reputable smiths. They just weren't used as weapons of war for the most part, at least as far as I know. So let's see what it says. An ego retainer practiced fencing with his son who used a ken. The retainer's katana broke. It was an Ishido Korakazu. So that's fascinating. Not only was the ken being used for fencing practice, but it they were both 
using apparently live blades. So that's some sometimes a question that's asked, do you ever practice fencing with sharps? Normally you would say no, you wouldn't use sharp blades to, to practice your, your swordsmanship because the risks are too great. You're going to hurt one another. You're going to damage the swords. This is an account where it happened at least one time, very unusually with a a, a surugi, a, a ken, in addition to the katana. And what happened when they practiced? One of the swords was was broken. So uh, an unusual account all, 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 all around. Number 18. Abushi named Nagai used the mune of his katana to hit the shiki, shiki'i of a house entrance, so the uh, threshold of the house entrance. The blade broke into three pieces. It was a katana with a big hamon, patterned after Kawachi no Kami Kunisuki. Number 22. An ego retainer used the backside of the kisaki to hit the hand of one of his servants. The monouchi part of the katana broke off. It was a uh, Mizuta Kunishige. Okay. At number 23, an eagle retainer fell from a horse and his blade broke in two. Uh-oh. Bad times. It was a Setsu no Kami Tadayuki. Number 24, last one. An Oshu retainer was paying respects in a temple. And for some reason, his blade bumped the Ishidon the stone rock steps, and the blade broke in two. This sword was from the Nao Yamashiro no Kami family. It was a Koto Bizen with a Choji Midari Hamon. The retainer had the remaining part of the blade made into a wakasashi about four, 40 centimeters long. Well, that is very interesting. Uh, able to be used in a variety of ways depending on the situation at hand. So that's some insight as to the sorts of things that were going on with swords of the period that we've been discussing between katana and rapier. Um, obviously, the invincible, indestructible katana was prone to failure. Now, it does sound like many of these accounts, the swords were being used in what we would consider abusive fashion. It was going up against stone in some cases. It was being struck on the back of the blade. And as Danny just mentioned, it was good smiths did test, test their blades that way to try and show that it was durable enough to survive those type of strikes. But it's still not the intended use of the sword. So that's an, an, a way to give it additional stress. But... It's still possible that even a, a well-made sword could have a catastrophic failure, and the swords of this period are thinner with wider hamon than earlier swords that have thicker um, cross sections and have um, thinner areas of of, um, 
of very uh, hard uh, cutting edges. So where does this leave us with our, our rapier question? I think that it's pretty easy to say that it could go either way. Either of the blades could fail, and it, you, you can't really predict that one is going to beat the other. E either one could have an off day and, and, and break in a fight between one or the other. If we did a thousand trials, mm, I would probably say that we're going to see more failures on the side of the rapier based on what we had, we've just discussed, this, comparing the, the nature of the two swords. The, the rapier is a lot thinner. I don't think that what's going to happen is the, the katana user is going to be able to ever cut through the, ra the, the rapierist's blade. Um, any good rapierist should be able to mitigate the uh, effects of that blow. Um, but again, lucky strikes could happen, and the same could be true the other direction. It might be that at some point the rapierist is striking against the katana, and the katana could break. So that sort of exchange is very difficult to, to know what's going to happen when physics takes over, and these, uh, these, these pieces of, of um, metallurgy and smithing um, skill come impacting at real high velocities, um, it's almost impossible to predict what's going to happen. And that's part of why we do these experimental archaeology and we get out there and actually test things. I'd love to someday be able to actually go and test this on an actual real sharp rapier. Um, hopefully there's some smith out there that's able to produce uh, a maybe a, a, bl a blade blank, a nice long, thin, sharp rapier that I can just clamp uh, in, in a vice, and we can just go at it and see exactly how much abuse it can take. Maybe it'll take just one good solid blow and the tip will come right off. Maybe it'll take a hundred blows and we'll, we'll see what it does. But we've, I've certainly seen plenty of katanas fail <laughs> over the years, sometimes from a very simple action, other times after a whole lot of abuse. Matthew Jensen's channel has lots of examples uh, for you to go check out. So, there, there we have it. Um, plenty of accounts from history of swords breaking uh, across the board. Hope you guys enjoyed. Take care.